coming up on the World Sailing Show this month. A decade of foiling, the ups and downs. The Olympic year kicks off in Miami with the World Cup Series. And another speed record falls to the French. A star-studded fleet of 73 boats started the 12th edition of the Royal Ocean Racing Club Caribbean 600 in sparkling Antigua conditions. 700 sailors from 37 nations began the 600-mile race around 11 Caribbean islands. The starting list read like a who's who of big boat sailing. There were America's Cup sailors, multi-hull record breakers and trailblazers. Maiden, the historic boat in which Tracy Edwards skippered the first all-female crew in the Whitbread Round the World race in 1989, is back and on a mission. The boat hasn't raced as Maiden since the 1989 Whitbread. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, you know, everything's really ready. We've, we've got the sails that the boat sailed around the world with, so, you know, nothing's that crisp anymore. But uh, we've got a really cool crew. We've been out training the last couple of days, so I think, you know, we're just going to have fun. We're going to get Maiden back out there on the racetrack and whatever happens, it's just a privilege to have her out there racing again. One of the fleets to watch was the multi-hulls, which were packed with some of the biggest names in sailing. Frank Camas, Brian Thompson, Loic Peron, Giovanni Soldini, all hugely experienced offshore racers, and they were spread across three Mod 70s. Also in the multi-hull class, the 80-foot Ultime Emotion 2, trying to snatch line honours, so a really close race was expected. There are five boats uh, with th uh, 370, uh, Maserati, Powerplay and Argo, uh, and also uh, Shockwave and Ultime. Argo and us are quite identical. More or less, really. Giovanni is working a lot on foils, full foil system, which are very efficient when they are working, which are a bit draggy when they are not, like any kind of foil system. So we know that in certain conditions we, we suffer, and then in other conditions we have uh, obviously a better speed. Last year's was a perfect condition, and this time doesn't look so good. That's the, it's the play. So you have to anticipate, you have to respect for sure, but you have to know very well your opponents and to know and to understand why they are faster and why they are going that way. Because if you know them, so you know that they are going to do something which is accurately defined by the type of boat they are. And then it's not only a story of following someone, it's a story of doing something different sometimes. Maybe it's not uh, just a race in speed, it could be a race in strategy and uh, there is a lot of uh, shift around the island and uh, this is important, I think, to, to win or to, <laughs> to lose the, the race. Variable conditions hit the fleet, meaning lots of sail changes and tactical decisions. But after almost two days racing, only four minutes separated the first two boats. Loic Perron helped the crew of Powerplay take line honours just ahead of Frank Camas on board Argo. Perron and crew completed the 600 miles aboard Powerplay in just under one day and 22 hours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For 31 years, Biscayne Bay and Miami have been an important stop on the Olympic class circuit. And this year, the year of the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, the second leg of the World Cup series was the final opportunity for American nations to qualify for those games. In the laser, Olympic qualification came down to two countries. All eyes were on Andrew Lewis of Trinidad and Tobago and five Canadian sailors chasing him down for a place at the Olympic Games. It wasn't the best of starts for Lewis up at the committee boat end of the line, and he headed upwind in sixth place. Hugh McRae led the Canadian charge out in front at the top mark, but a wind shift soon shuffled the pack. The race for gold was nail-biting. Stefano Pesquiera of Peru and Enrique Pacas of El Salvador reeled in McRae on the final downwind leg. 
Then a crucial penalty, handed to Pacas, gave the advantage to the Peruvian, who pulled ahead. Pesquiera held that advantage to the finish, winning the medal race and claiming the gold. Trinidadian Andrew Lewis managed a fourth place finish, good enough to qualify for Tokyo 2020, his third Olympic Games, and you could see what it meant to him. Four years ago, in order to compete at Rio 2016, Lewis had to fight back from an accident that left him with life-threatening injuries. I never thought with all this metal in my leg and in my face and stuff that I'd be able to compete at a high level again. And last year I broke all my records and um, I have a team that's bigger than ever. I come from this one, a small island. Canada's millions of people. We have just over a million people in my country. Five Canadians battling on one athlete. It's just that so much harder. When it's that much harder, it's that much more special. And, uh, you know, the Caribbean boys, the Latin boys, we play hard and we celebrate hard. And that's the style of celebration that you saw today. In the laser radial, the focus was on USA's Erika Reinecke, who started with just a two-point lead. Her nearest challengers were Vasileo Karakaliou of Greece, who got away well, and third placed Matilda Taluri of Italy. A wind shift immediately after the start saw the fleet tack and head out to the right. Nethra Kumanan of India recovered from a poor start to reach the top mark in the lead. Downwind, Karakaliu moved into second place, whilst Reinecke had fallen back to eighth. Suddenly, the gold medal was within reach for the Greek. When the boats reached the top mark for the final time, Kumanan had slipped back to third. But behind her, a huge battle was going on, with Reinecke back in the hunt, right behind Karakaliu. But then the Greek was handed a penalty turn. It meant Reinecke went ahead, and it was game over for Karakaliu. An incredible performance from Kumanan saw her win the race. The Indian, who started the day 12 points from the podium, had done enough for bronze, India's first ever World Cup Series medal. Honestly, I wasn't expecting it, and I went into today just to save my own race, and I got very lucky, I think, so I don't think it's quite hit me yet, <laughs> but uh, I'm happy. For Reinecke, it was a fifth place finish, but it was enough to hold on to the gold with Karakaliu taking silver. In the Finn, Mexico had already claimed the Olympic qualifying place, and the USA's Caleb Payne had already won gold with an unassailable lead. Yet there was still so much at stake in this medal race. Facundo Oletza of Argentina made the early gains, but the battle to represent the USA in Tokyo was unfolding on the right-hand side of the course. 23-year-old Luke Muller and Rio 2016 bronze medalist Kayla Payne may be teammates, but only one of them can go to the games, and the point selection is really close. Nearing the end, it was disaster for Muller as he was working his way back up through the fleet. A penalty for pumping meant a 360-degree turn, and now the youngster was playing catch-up again. As Oletza of Argentina turned for the final reach to the line, Kyle Martin of Canada was second, enough to take the silver. Behind them, Muller managed to hold on for the bronze medal. It was a small RSX fleet that took to Biscayne Bay this year, with most sailors representing the Americans. USA's Pedro Pascual had a terrific week, with top three finishes in every race. His dominance continued to the end as he won the medal race to secure gold on his home waters. The women's medal race saw Canadian veteran Nicola Gurk hold the lead from the start. But the final run to the line saw an extraordinary comeback from Mexican Demita Vega de Lille. The softening breeze was making it very hard work for the sailors, and the overnight leader from Mexico went ahead and with that move, also sealed the gold. The 470 class saw the biggest fleet and widest representation here in Miami. The women's medal race got underway with all 10 boats able to win a medal. The light winds were making for a tactical battle, and Italians Elena Berta and Bianca Caruso won the first leg, reaching the top mark in the lead, ahead of 2017 world champion Agnieszka Skrupelec of Poland. An excellent downwind leg saw the Poles take the lead and move into the gold medal position ahead of overnight leaders Camille Lecointe and Aloise Retournaz of France. But the French spotted some breeze out on the right. It was a move that changed everything. 
As they converged on the leaders from the top of the screen, it was the French who had the advantage. Le Quinte and Retonnaz had gone from sixth to first in just one leg. The French crossed the finish line to take their fourth World Cup Series gold, their first outside France. Cette année elle est particulièrement importante parce que c'est l'année des Jeux Olympiques, donc c'est une super compète pour nous à Miami et une super, un super résultat de pouvoir gagner la première compétition de l'année. Donc bon, faut pas qu'on se repose là-dessus, il va y avoir beaucoup de, de compétitions encore, donc on va essayer de, de continuer à s'entraîner à fond et de rester concentré. The current World Cup Series champions, Matt Belcher and Will Ryan of Australia went into the 470 men's race as overall leaders, but were equal on points with Japan's Keiju Okada and Junpei Hokazono. As the fleet converged at the top mark, it was the team who started fourth overall, Jordi Chama and Nicolas Rodriguez of Spain, who came out in front. On the second upwind leg, the other Japanese boat in the race chose the far left side of the course, and it paid off. Kazuto Doi and Nayoa Kimura went ahead. Belcher and Ryan, however, had a poor leg that saw them drop back to sixth place. Suddenly, they'd fallen off the podium altogether. The youngsters from Spain, sitting second, put in an early jive and went for the overtake just ahead of the final turn to the finish. It was a move that sealed both the race victory and regatta gold. It was Chamar and Rodriguez's second consecutive World Cup Series win in Miami. Silver went to Akada and Hokazono, and Belcher and Ryan had to make do with bronze. Still to come on the World Sailing Show, we go foiling in Sardinia with Ineos Team UK. Plus this Kiwi super duo take their sixth world title. Still to come, the foiling boats taking the oceans by storm. Plus, the fastest ever tea delivery to London. Hydrofoils. They've been on sailboats for three quarters of a century, but the last decade has been a game changer. From the first foiling America's Cup catamarans in 2013, to the competition's first foiling monohulls in 2019. Unlike any other decade, the development of the foil spread across classes and disciplines. So as well as huge ocean-going foiling trimarans, we now have foiling kites and flying boards. All have given us unimaginable speed, thrills and daring feats, sometimes at a cost. I think it's amazing uh, the change in sport of sailing through uh, the foiling technology that's, that's come in. And now through 2019, I guess the biggest changes would be these foiling 75 foot monohulls that we have with the America's Cup and seeing boats of that scale lifting up out of the water. Ben Ainsley, the world's most successful Olympic sailor, launched his British team's America's Cup boat last year. The AC50 was a huge change from the foiling catamarans of the previous cup. It's been really interesting, you know, moving into the AC-75 after the AC-50, you know, the AC-50 being a multi-hull as opposed to the 75-foot monohull that we now have, and also two rudders on the AC-50 as opposed to one with the monohull. So some, some quite big differences, but ultimately when you get the boat out of the water, they're both still foiling, and the, the key to, to performance really is, is keeping the boat out of the water as much as possible. I think the toughest thing about the AC-75 yeah, it sounds a bit obvious really, but the scale of the boat is quite daunting, both from a sailing perspective, but probably more so from a you know, maintenance design perspective. The loads that the boat is going through, you know, again, how you design around that, how you operate the boat and maintain the boat. So that's probably the biggest challenge. The move from foiling cats in 2017 to the AC-75 monohull has not always been smooth and continues to push technology and sailors to the max. 
When the first boats were launched, nobody could be sure how they would react for real on the water. The American Magic team has only just released footage of a nosedive they experienced in their prototype boat. America's Cup defenders, Emirates Team New Zealand, were the first to release footage of a full-size boat capsizing. Italy's Luna Rossa team have only just finished repairs following a mast breakage last month. But it's not just the America's Cup that's breaking boundaries. France's top sailors recently pushed their foiling trimarans to the max in the Brest Atlantique race. Speed records have fallen. And later this year, the Vendée Globe solo round the world race will be led by a new generation of foiling in Mocha 60s. The Sail GP circuit has kicked off a second season of five events with pent-up versions of their lightning-fast foiling F50s. This year, the seven-team lineup will see Ainsley skipper the British boat and a new Danish team join the series. The catamaran broke the 50-knot barrier last year, but the boat's designer believes it's just the start. With Sail GP, it's a, it's a chance to reinvent uh, how we think of uh, short course racing yachts and whether it's better foils or a different hull configuration or just simpler from the point of view of uh, launching and retrieving and packing off to the next regatta. We're in a slightly different position to most yacht racing where we have very few rules and constraints on what we're doing. We have to fit the boat into a 40 foot shipping container. Uh, we want the boat to be fast, we want it to be interesting to sail. But we can fill in all the gaps between those constraints and so it's pretty unusual to have a, such a blank canvas to uh, work in. You know, uh, how many foils do we have? Do we have six or do we have one? Um, how do we control it? What's, what does the wing look like? And, and so on. And in, in some respects this is much harder because there's, there's no constraints on our imagination. Back in Sardinia, INEOS Team UK have continued their testing and training. The boat was performing well, uh, the guys were sailing well on board and it's just a constant development. The more time we can get on the water the better and so we'll be pushing really hard for this period to, to maximise those hours out there. And it's on these waters near Cagliari in April that we'll get our first glimpse of this latest development in foiling race boats going head to head for the first time in the America's Cup World Series. The Southern Hemisphere's longest intercontinental yacht race, the Cape to Rio, was won by Love Water. The 80-foot trimaran, skippered by Craig Sutherland, took line honours in 7 days, 20 hours, 24 minutes, for the crossing from Cape Town to Rio, setting a race record. Seven hours behind them came the race favourite, Maserati, skippered by Giovanni Soldini. Early on in the race, the boat experienced damage to its foils and the crew had to improvise repairs. Geelong in Southeast Australia hosted three world championships, the 49er, 49er FX and NACRA 17 Olympic fleets battled it out not just for world medals but for Olympic qualification too. Just a couple of months since their last 49er world title victory, New Zealanders Peter Burling and Blair Tuke started the medal race with a comfortable 18-point lead. They defended that lead, finishing fourth in the medal race to claim their sixth world title. Pretty stoked to win this one and you know, it's obviously, uh, yeah, being Olympic year, a pretty uh, cool one to win as well and you know, one we really you know, want to test our skills at, so yeah, we're pretty, uh, pretty on top of the world to walk away with another one. There was a thrilling match race in the 49er FX medal race between overall leaders Tamara Echegoyen and Paolo Barcelo of Spain and British pair Charlotte Dobson and Saskia Tidy. Whoever beat who would take the gold. It was cat and mouse all the way until disaster struck the British. Their kite filled with water and over they went. The Spanish sped away knowing the title was theirs. Americans Stephanie Robel and Maggie Shea also took advantage and went on to claim the bronze. John Gimson and Anna Burnett of Great Britain bounced back from a breakage earlier in the day to claim the NACRA 17 world crown. Big relief because we were pushed so hard by Ben and Nicky, our teammates. They could have gone either way in the trials and we got it in the last event, but 
there's been a tight trials which always makes it a bit better. Behind them, there was everything at stake for Australia's two top NACRA 17 teams. Nathan and Hayley Outridge and Jason Waterhouse and Lisa Darmanin continued their Olympic qualification battle. In the end, the Outridges went one better, taking the silver. Days of old, when ships raced from Hong Kong to London with the year's new crop of tea and the winner took 100 days. Modern times and five men and a foiling trimaran have completed the historic tea route in just under 32 days. French skipper Francis Joyon and his crew left Hong Kong in January aboard their 14-year-old boat, Edex Port. Success was about balancing the need for speed with the need to protect the boat. Joyon, the red boat on our tracker, was aiming to beat the previous record held for two years by Italian Giovanni Soldini, represented by the white boat. The Indian Ocean saw Edex Sport gain over 800 miles on the old record, only to lose it in the South Atlantic before going ahead again in the North Atlantic trade winds. When Joyon crossed the finish line at the QE2 bridge, the Frenchman had beaten the record by four days, three hours and 26 seconds. C'est vrai que c'est un trajet tellement long et tellement varié que on peut que revenir sur des centaines de souvenirs, c'est dur de le résumer comme ça. On n'avait plus d'eau, on n'avait plus d'électricité, on n'avait plus de pilote automatique, c'était vraiment la misère hein, quand on, a, on, a, on était obligé de couper euh, tous nos appareils, enfin on était, on était dans le blackout total. Euh, et la prochaine fois on s'est dit on passera à acheter des, un petit bidon avec un bidon de valide de gasoil, on aurait été sauvé, mais bon on ne l'avait pas. Joyon and his crew had sailed at an average speed of 20.7 knots, covering a distance of just under 16,000 nautical miles. Euh, bah, C'est un vrai plaisir d'être arrivé à Londres aujourd'hui. Je pense qu'on a fait un joli temps. En fait, 31 jours, nous, c'est vraiment ce qu'on espérait faire. Là, euh, on n'espérait pas plus. Euh, c'est vraiment un... On pensait que l'arrivée sur la Tamise serait vraiment très compliquée. On a fait une centaine de, de virements de bord pour arriver jusqu'à la ligne d'arrivée qui, euh, qui était sous le pont. Joyon's boat can now add the T-Route record to her three route to run victories and the Jules Verne Trophy. Next month on the World Sailing Show, thrills and spills for the opening event of the Sail GP season. And they're back. The TP52 Super Series returns to action.